lost in the fog. The atmosphere was so thick in Dillis Price's shop that you could cut it with a knife. Norman had been letting off stink bombs again. Oh, Norman, said Dillis, spraying air fresh and all around the place. Yes, ma'am, said Norman. That smells permanented through the whole house. It was an accident, ma'am. Honest. Accident, my foot, scolded Dillis. Now someone's got to clean the shop right through. Well, I do it, ma'am. But I've got to catch the bus to Newtown with Penny and James. We're going to Penny Morris's house for tea, and then we're off to the pictures after. Well, you can put that right out of your mind, said Dillis. And she left Norman to clean the shop while she went over to Bella's cafe to have a sit down with a cup of tea and the newspaper. Well, I never. It do say here in my horoscope that the world is my oyster. Now, what do you think of that then, Bella? Oh, you no believe the horoscope in Mrs. Surprise. It's a rubbish, the fortune telling. Mrs. Lasagna? My grandmother came from pure Romany stock. She once told me that I would have a son who'd be Prime Minister of Wales one day. James and Sarah, who were at the next table, were amazed. What, Norman? said James. <laughs> said Sarah. Mamma mia, Bella said. Yes, tea leaves told her. And what's more, she taught me how to read them. Have you finished with your cup? Dillis took Bella's teacup and stared at the tea leaves in the bottom. Oh, I see travel and, uh, uh, yes. You're going to meet a man soon. He's dark and handsome. Oh, that's amazing, said James. Will you tell our fortunes, Mrs. Price? said Sarah, and they gave their teacups to Dillis. She peered at the tea leaves carefully. Oh, um, uh, um, oh, I see you going on a long journey this afternoon to Newtown. Wow, said Sarah. That's amazing. Is there anything else? Well, um, uh, there's so much to see, see, said Dillis quickly, just as Trevor the bus came into the cafe. Oh, there you are, he said to the twins. Come on, you two, we better get going. Mamma mia, said Bella, looking at Trevor. He's the dark and handsome man. Oh, Trevor, said Dillis. Oh, well, yes, there <laughs> you are. You see, my predicament came true. Trevor's bus, with James and Sarah on board, was soon driving through the countryside on the way to Newtown. Sarah was looking out of the window. Oh, look at those daisies, she said to James. Can you stop here, Mr. Evans, so we can pick them for Penny? We'll walk the rest of the way. All right, my sugar lumps, said Trevor, stopping the bus. But there's a fog on the hills up there, and it'll be real pea super before long. So take care, and don't dawdle. Thanks, Mr. Evans. We won't, called the twins as Trevor drove. Brilliant, said Sarah. Penny loves flowers. Come on. And off they went through a wooden gate across the field to where the daisies were growing. They were so absorbed in picking great big bunches of flowers that they didn't notice that the fog was starting to get thicker. Come on, said James. We missed the film. No, we won't, said Sarah. Let's have a few more minutes. Uh, Sarah, said James. I can't see the gate. Sarah looked up. It's over there, she said. They walked across the field. They could just see the fence in the fog, but there was no gate. Then it must be this way, said Sarah. They walked back the other way, but there was no gate there either. It was getting very foggy and very cold. We are lost, cried Sarah. Back in Pontypandy, the phone was ringing at the fire station. Sam picked it up. Good afternoon, Pontypandy Fire Station. Sam. It's Penny. Have you seen Sarah and James? They should be here by now, and with this fog. Sam had a quick think. I tell you what, Penny, can you meet me halfway? They've got to be somewhere between Pontypandy and Newtown. Will do. So, 
Sam jumped into Jupiter, switched on the headlights, and drove slowly out of Pontypandy in the thick fog towards Newtown. At the same time, Penny was in her rescue tender, taking the road towards Pontypandy. Sam's voice came through on the radio. Fireman Sam to firefighter Penny Morris. Over. Go ahead, Sam. Over. Whereabouts are you? Good question, Sam. It's so foggy that I can't see any landmarks. Oh, just a minute. There are some headlights up ahead. Hang on, Penny. There's a car. Heavens, it's Jupiter. The fire engine and the rescue tender had come face to face in the narrow country lane. Sam climbed out of his cab. Oh, that was close, he said. I've always said we needed radar. There's no sign of the children then. No, nothing, said Penny, peering through the fog. Then she noticed something white on the ground by a gate. Hey, look, what's this? It's someone's hanky, and there's an S on it. Let's see, said Sam. That's Sarah's. They must have gone into the field, said Penny. I'll go and look, said Sam. You stay here in case they find their way back. Okay, Sam, said Penny, and she watched as Sam disappeared through the gate and into the fog. It was beginning to get very gloomy, and somewhere out in the thick mist, the twins were still trying to find their way back to the gate. I, I was sure we were going the right way, said Sarah anxiously. We are lost because of you, said James. It's not my fault, said Sarah, just because... Oh! Oh! She started to sink into a marshy, muddy piece of ground. There was nothing to hold on to. And she just kept sinking lower and lower into the mud. The ground's swallowing me up, she cried. Here, grab my hand, shouted James. It, it's no good. I can't reach. Help, somebody, help. Far away across the field, Sam heard the children's voices. Sarah, James, he called. I'm on my way. He ran through the thick fog in the direction of their cries and soon found Sarah almost up to her neck in mud. She was still sinking. Great fires of London, gasped Sam. I can't come forward or I'll sink too. Now, keep quite still, Sarah. Hyman Sam, the firefighter Penny Morris. Over. Hello, Sam. Any luck? Over. Drive straight across this field just as fast as you can. Right you are. Penny started up the fire tender, switched on the blue flashing light, and drove through the gate across the field. Fireman Sam could see her headlights coming towards him through the gloom. I'll get some rope, he said as soon as Penny arrived. You prepare the winch. Now, Sarah, I'm going to throw you a rope like a lasso, and you've got to get the loop under your arms. OK, Uncle Sam, said Sarah. Sam threw the rope. Got it, said Sarah. Well done, called Sam. Now, Penny, start winching. Hold on tight, Sarah. You're almost there. Sarah held on very tight indeed, and slowly the rope pulled her out of the mud towards Sam and Penny. Try and grab my hand, Sarah, called Sam. Sarah reached out and caught Sam's hand. There you are, he said, giving her a big hug. A bit muddy, but none the worse. Oh, thanks, Uncle Sam. As soon as they got back to Pontypandy, Sam took them all to Bella's Cafe for a nice hot meal. Bon appetit, said Bella. My mum would always say to me, a nice sort of ravioli make you forget your troubles. They were just tucking in when the door opened and in came Gillis and Norman. What are you two doing here? Gillis asked the twins. You're supposed to be in the pictures. How do you know that? Asked Sarah. Oh, oh, uh, it, uh, just, it just comes to me. It's the tea leaf, see? No, it isn't, said Norman. I told her this morning about going to Penny's. And... <laughs> he didn't manage to say any more because his mum had a hand firmly over his mouth. Oh, 
What a little chatterbox Norman can be, she said. But she looked very embarrassed indeed. When he used the fire bell chime, fireman Sam is there on time. Someone might be in a jam. So hurry, hurry, fireman Sam. Always on the scene, fireman Sam. And his engine's bright and clean. Fireman Sam, you cannot ignore. Sam's Night Watch. Sarah and James were on their way to the park to play. Let's see if Uncle Sam wants to come with us, said Sarah. That's strange, said James, when they got to Sam's house. All the curtains are drawn. Puzzled, James knocked on the door. 
but there was no answer. He was just going to knock again when Sarah stopped him. I've just remembered, she said. Uncle Sam is on night watch at the fire station this week, so he works at night and sleeps during the day. Oh, dear, said James. I hope we haven't woken him up. Shh, hissed Sarah as they tiptoed away. They did not have to worry, for upstairs in his bedroom, Sam was fast asleep. With the curtains drawn, the whole house was dark. Not a thing stirred. The only thing to be heard was the tick, tick, tick of the alarm clock by Sam's bed. The clock ticked happily to itself all day. Then suddenly, at five o'clock in the afternoon, it went off. Sam awoke with a start. Where's the fire? He cried, leaping out of bed. He felt very silly when he remembered where he was. Well, at least it got me up, he said sheepishly. Sam went downstairs to make his breakfast. I can never get used to having my breakfast at tea time, he said, pouring out a bowl of cornflakes. But that's what happens when you're on night watch. All your days are back to front. Sam got dressed and checked his uniform in the mirror before leaving the house. As he walked to the fire station, everybody else was going home. Even Mrs. Price was closing the store for the evening. At the fire station, Sam checked in with Station Officer Steele, who had been in charge of the day watch. On time as usual, Sam, he said, yawning. <sighs> Good show. The fire brigade must be ready for emergencies at all times, day and night. Then leaving Sam in charge, Steele went home. Mess officer Elvis Cridlington had also finished work for the day. I've left a little something for you in a pan on the stove in case you get hungry during the night, he said. Why, well, um, thank you, Elvis, said Sam weakly. Whenever Elvis left something in the pan, it was usually because it refused to come out. After Station Officer Steele and Elvis Cridlington had gone, Sam was all alone in the fire station. His night watch had begun. He checked Jupiter, the fire engine, to make sure it was ready should he be called out to answer an emergency, and having done that, he went upstairs to wait. Sam waited and waited. The phone didn't ring, the alarm bell didn't go off, and nobody rushed in from the street shouting fire. Sam wandered over to the stove to see what Elvis had left. Whatever it was, it was cold and rubbery and a very peculiar color. Meanwhile, Trevor Evans was walking home. He had been to the cinema. He reached his front door and put his hand in his pocket to pull out his keys. His pocket was empty. In a panic, he searched all his other pockets. They were empty too. Oh, no, he groaned. I've lost my keys. I'm locked out. Desperately, he tried the door, just in case he'd forgotten to lock it. He hadn't. It was well and truly locked. I know, he said. Perhaps I can climb in through a window. But all the big front windows were locked too. Trevor sat down on the doorstep and sighed. He sat and he thought. And he had an idea. Of course, he cried. The pantry window. Now that has never shut properly. Trevor rushed round the side of the house and sure enough, the little window was ajar. It's a tight squeeze, he gasped as he squirmed and wriggled in through the open window. Then quite suddenly, he couldn't move at all. Not forwards, not backwards. He huffed and he puffed. He pushed and he pulled. He kicked, he struggled and he strained. But he couldn't move an inch. He stopped to catch his breath. It's no good, he gasped. I'm stuck. 
Across the road, Mrs. Price was putting out the milk bottles before going to bed. As she did, she looked up and saw Trevor's legs sticking out of his pantry window, kicking and thrashing about. Mrs. Price went as white as a sheet. Eek! She shrieked. It's a burglar! Mrs. Price phoned the police from the phone box by her store. When the policeman arrived, he went over to Trevor's house with his torch. Hello, hello. What's all this then? He said, addressing the pair of legs that were sticking out of Trevor's pantry window. Arrest him! It's a burglar! Squealed Mrs. Price. No, I'm not, said the pair of legs. I'm Trevor Evans and I'm stuck. I lost my keys, tried to climb in the window, and here I am. The policeman gave Trevor's legs an experimental tug, thought for a minute, and began to talk importantly into his walkie-talkie. Across town, at Ponty Pandy Fire Station, the phone rang. Sam answered it. An emergency? Where? I'll be there right away, he said. Sam sprang into action. He slid down the pole, threw open the huge fire station doors and climbed into the cab of Jupiter, the fire engine. The engine roared into life and Sam drove Jupiter out into the night, its blue light flashing brightly. He raced through the quiet, lamplit streets of Ponty Pandy, under the viaduct, and around the corner by Mrs. Price's store. It wasn't long before he reached the street where Trevor lived. With the arrival of Sam and Jupiter, it became quite busy outside Trevor's house. Bella, the Italian lady who owned the cafe, had come out to see what was going on. Mrs. Price was talking non-stop, and the policeman was solemnly taking notes in his notebook. Then, of course, there was Trevor. This is really embarrassing, said Trevor when the policeman took Sam round to the pantry window. I don't usually do this sort of thing. Don't worry, Trevor, said Sam confidently. We'll have you out of there in a jiffy. Sam looked at the policeman and nodded. One, two, three, pull! said Sam, and he and the policeman took a leg each and pulled. Ow! Ouch! cried Trevor. Stop! Stop! We could try pushing, said the policeman. So they tried pushing. Ow! Ouch! cried Trevor. Stop! Don't! Sam and the policeman tried pulling again. He's moving, cried Sam. Pop! Pop! Sam fell backwards. Whoops, he said. False alarm. I pulled his shoe off. Mrs. Price had wandered up to see what was happening and had to duck as the shoe flew over her head. Well, I never, she exclaimed. Meanwhile, Jupiter's blue flashing light had woken Sarah and James. They got up and peered out of the bedroom window. Look, cried Sarah. It's Uncle Sam. I wonder what's going on, said James. They put on their dressing gowns and went downstairs to find out. They saw naughty Norman Price, who would also come out to see what was happening. Luckily, he thought the sight of poor Trevor stuck in the window was so funny that he was giggling too much to cause any mischief. Sarah and James caught sight of Sam and ran over to him. It would be easier if somebody could push Trevor from the other side while somebody pulled from this, Sam explained to the children. But we can't get into the house. Sam thought for a minute. I suppose I could always break down the door. Oh, no, you don't, cried Trevor. I only had it painted last week. Sam went round to the front door just to see if there was any way in at all. He looked at the keyhole, the door knocker, the letterbox. Are you going to chop it down? asked Norman excitedly. 
I hope not, said Sam, peering through the letterbox. As he peered, Sam smiled a broad smile. Aha, he said in a triumphant kind of way. There, sitting on a table in the hallway, were Trevor's keys. So he hadn't lost them after all. He'd just forgotten them when he went out. That made things a lot easier. Sam went over to Jupiter and started rummaging around in one of the fire engine's lockers. He was looking for something. Something in particular. He rummaged around a little more, finally pulling out a very odd contraption indeed. Aha! He said again. My extra extending gadget grabbers. Sam stuck one end of the contraption through the letterbox and pressed the handles together. It stretched across the hallway like a pair of extra long arms. He twiddled the dial and it picked the keys up. Pulling the handles apart again, the contraption shrank back towards the letterbox. Carefully, he pulled the contraption out and took the keys. He opened Trevor's front door and went inside. Putting the gadget grabbers down on the hall table, he walked on through to the pantry. He opened the door and switched on the light. Trevor! cried Sam in horror. There he was, stuck in the window frame and munching away on a packet of biscuits. Sam! exclaimed Trevor, trying to hide the biscuits. No wonder we couldn't get you out. You've been stuffing yourself with biscuits all the time, laughed Sam. I was feeling a little peckish, explained Trevor weakly. Sam called to the policeman and asked if he was ready. He was. Right, Trevor, explained Sam. This is it. Now, when I say go, you must breathe out and pull your tummy in. I'm going to push and the policeman's going to pull. You'll be out in no time. Trevor didn't seem too sure. Go, cried Sam. Trevor breathed out and pulled his tummy in. Sam and the policeman pushed and pulled. They jiggled and they jostled. They tried it in little bursts. They tried it in long ones. There were all sorts of grunts and groans and cries of, He's moving! And, No, he isn't! And, Nearly there! Then, all of a sudden, almost without warning, there was a loud pop, like a cork being pulled from a bottle. One moment, Trevor was in the window. The next, he was sitting on top of the policeman. Everybody cheered. Bella came over with some hot tea and biscuits. Lovely, said Sam, taking a cup of tea and a biscuit. Thank you kindly, madam, said the policeman, taking a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, I've gone off biscuits, said Trevor, just taking a cup of tea. Sam laughed. After his tea, Sam packed his gadget grabbers away. Everybody drifted back indoors now that the excitement was over and went to bed. The policeman went off to fill in his reports and after saying good night to Trevor, Sam drove back to the fire station. After all, he was still on night watch. Sam stayed on duty all night and at half past seven in the morning, station officer Steele turned up for work. He was taking the day watch. Quiet night? he asked. Oh, so so, replied Sam. You're never stuck for anything to do being a fireman. When he got home, Sam went straight to bed. Then he got up again. He had forgotten to set the alarm clock. That would never do, he said, setting it and climbing back into bed. After all, I have to get up at five o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on night watch again tonight. When he hears the firebell chime, Fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat in less than seven seconds flat. He's always on the scene, Fireman Sam, and his engine's bright and clean. Fireman Sam, you cannot ignore. Sam is the hero next door.
It was a sunny day in Pontypandy. On his way to the fire station, Fireman Sam popped into Mrs. Price's shop to buy a morning newspaper. Morning, Dillis, said Fireman Sam. It's a lovely day today. Is it? Dillis replied. I've been working so hard, I hadn't even noticed. As Fireman Sam stepped outside the shop, Sarah and James came racing down the high street on their bicycles. Look out, Uncle Sam, shouted James. Great fires of London, Fireman Sam exclaimed. Quickly he leapt out of the way, accidentally knocking into a crate of Dillis Price's best tomatoes. Sorry, Uncle Sam, apologised Sarah. Me too, said James. Why don't you two go for a ride in the countryside, Sam suggested. You're less likely to run into someone there. Good idea, Uncle Sam, said James. Come on, Sarah. The twins turned round and rode out of the village. Later that morning, Sam walked into the mess hall at the fire station. Oh, breakfast smells delicious, he remarked. That's because Elvis didn't cook it, said Station Officer Steele. He handed Sam a dish. He's gone to Newtown to collect a consignment of spare tyres. I hope he's not going to use the tyres in a new recipe, laughed Sam as he tucked into his breakfast. 
Firefighter Elvis Cridlington had picked up the tyres from Newtown and was now on his way back to Pontypandy. He steered Jupiter up the bumpy road beside Pandy River. When he spotted Sarah and James coming towards him on their bicycles, he stopped to say hello. Hi, Sarah. Hi, James, he called. Hi, Elvis, shouted Sarah. We're having a race and I'm winning. No, she's not, called James. Yes, I am, replied Sarah. Elvis chuckled and waved, then continued on his way. Punty Pundy, here I come, <whistles> whistled Elvis. I'll bet Fireman Sam and Station Officer Steele miss not having my special cooked breakfast this morning, he thought, as the big red fire engine bumped along the road. At the top of the hill, Jupiter bounced over an especially big bump, causing the locker door to fly open. Elvis didn't notice as the tyres tumbled out of the locker and rolled back down the hill towards the river. Sarah and James were racing along at full speed when they spotted some tyres rolling down the hill past them. From the corner of his eye, James could see that there were more tyres coming down the hill behind them and they were gaining speed. The twins had to do something, and quickly. Watch out! cried James. The twins swerved out of the way. Oh no! cried Sarah as her bike crashed into a hedge. Whoa! yelled James. He careered out of control down the embankment. James and his bike landed in the river with a mighty splash. The current carried James down river. Finally, he managed to grab onto a tree branch that was overhanging the water. But the branch was slippery and James had to fight against the current. He didn't know how long he'd be able to hold on. Help! he cried. Sarah, get help! Sarah climbed out of the hedge and raced to the river. Hang on, James, she called. I'll go and ring the fire brigade. At the fire station, Fireman Sam had come out to the forecourt to help Elvis unload the tyres. It looks like you forgot the tyres, Elvis, said Sam, pointing to the empty locker. That's funny, replied Elvis. I'm sure they were there when I left Newtown. Just then, Station Officer Steele sounded the alarm. Jump to it, he cried. James has fallen into Pandy River. Great fires of London, cried Sam, as he and Elvis jumped aboard Jupiter. They sped out of the station, sirens wailing. As Jupiter raced towards the river, Elvis spotted the tyres scattered beside the road. Look, we found my tyres, he said. Sam parked Jupiter near the bridge where Sarah was waiting. Hurry, Uncle Sam, she cried. Don't worry, Sarah, replied Sam. We'll soon have James on dry land. Quickly, the firefighters unloaded the ladders from Jupiter. But even the longest extension ladder didn't reach James. Darro, groaned Elvis. What are we going to do now? Help, James cried. I can't hang on much longer. Suddenly, Farman Sam had an idea. Sam sprang into action. He grabbed one of the tires from the roadside and tied a long rope round it. Then he threw the tire into the water from upriver. He held on tightly to the end of the rope as the current swept the tire towards James. Still holding on to the tree branch with one hand, James reached out for the tire with the other. It's working, said Elvis, as the current carried the tire to James. Put the tire over your head, James, and hold on tight, shouted Sam. Fireman Sam, Elvis, and Station Officer Steele lined up in a row on the river bank. They pulled the rope as hard and as fast as they could until they had towed James safely onto the bank. Quick thinking, Sam, said Steele as they lifted James out of the water. Thanks, Uncle Sam, said James. You saved me. Luckily, there's no harm done, said Sam as he wrapped a blanket around a very wet James. Are you all right, sir? I'm OK, but my bike's not, she replied. They've got a bent front wheel. And mine's got a bent back wheel, groaned James as he examined his bike. It's all my fault, moaned Elvis. I should have made sure that the tyres were safely locked in the locker. Sam rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Let's go home and I'll see what I can do with the bikes, he said. Sam and Elvis loaded them into Jupiter, and they all drove back to Ponty Pandy. The next day, at the fire station, Elvis made the twins an ice cream Sunday treat for the trouble he'd caused them. My favourite, said Sarah. Mine too, said James. 
And when you've finished, we've got a special surprise for you, said Elvis, with a mysterious grin. When the twins had finished their Sundays, they followed Elvis to the station forecourt. Where's our special surprise? asked James excitedly. Well, I'm afraid we couldn't straighten the wheels on your bikes, Elvis told the twins, but Sam did the next best thing. Fireman Sam and Station Officer Steele appeared riding a strange-looking bicycle. I couldn't fix your bikes, said Sam, so I made a tandem. Brill, said James. Fantastic, exclaimed Sarah. It'll be the only one in Ponty Bandy. after the twins' birthday, and they were on their way to Uncle Sam's. He promised to take them swimming as a birthday treat. James was carrying a brand new model plane with a remote control. It's Brill, this plane, he said. I'm glad I asked for it. It's mine as much as yours, said Sarah. As they reached Sam's house, Penny was just leaving. Hello, Uncle Sam. Hello, Penny, said Sarah. We brought our bathers. Well, I've just been trying to ring you two, said Sam. I'm afraid I can't take you swimming. Station Officer Steele's got the flu, so I've got to work this afternoon. Oh, no, said the children. I've only got my lunch hour, said Penny, but we could go to the park and try out the plane. OK, said the children, cheering up a bit. See you later, Uncle Sam. Right or Enjoy yourselves. Sam waved goodbye as James and Sarah jumped into Penny's fire tender and they all drove off to the park. In Bella's cafe, Dillis and Bella were having a cup of tea. Bella was showing off a great big ring on her finger. He's a family heirloom. He's a beautiful. No, Mrs. Surprise. Hmm, muttered Dillis. They can work wonders in class these days, can't they? They looked up as Trevor Evans came in. Good morning, ladies, and two of the loveliest ladies in Ponty Pondy. There's luck for me. Oh, you were a card, Trevor. Well, I'll have a cup of tea, please, Bella, my lovely. OK, and just the wash of the cups. Goodness me, was that on your finger? You've got a diamond bigger than a sugar lump. Have you got yourself engaged to a millionaire? Don't be daft, man, scolded Dillis. She inhabited that ring. Just then, Dillis's boy Norman 
popped his head round the door of the cafe. Ma'am, there's a man in the shop. Tell him I'm closed for lunch from the VAT. Oh, no, excuse me. No, man, wait. Hang on, come back here this minute. What exactly did you tell him? Dillis rushed out after Norman as Bella put Trevor's cup of tea down on the table. Now, come on, Bella, my lovely, said Trevor. Let's have a proper look at that beautiful ring of yours. Bella held out her hand so that Trevor could get a good look at the ring. But it wasn't there anymore. Bella Bach, where is it? Mamma mia, she disappeared into a slim air. Well, you had it on when you washed those cups. Cara mia, I've lost it in the sink. She went over to the sink and had a good look all round it. Oh, no, no, is there nothing here? Well, it's gone down the plagool, it has. I bet you anything. I just hit the grill off the hole and reached down here. But Trevor's hand was too big to reach down the plug hole. So while Bella tried reaching down with her hand, Trevor got down underneath the sink to try and undo the waste pipe. Now, um, which one is it? Oh, ah, must be this one. Oh, lovely neck. Trevor, what have you done? Fredding have snapped the cold water pipe. Come over here, Bella, quick. I can't. My hand is stuck in the plug hole. Out in the park, Penny was helping James and Sarah fly the model plane. Ready for takeoff? I think so, said Sarah. Right then, said James. Chucks away, lift off. Penny let the plane go and it flew right up over the park. Sarah had the remote control. That's brilliant, said James. Make it loop the loop. Sarah was just doing a fantastic loop the loop. Norman Price appeared. Sure, I said. That's a wicked brain, that. Can I have a go? Oh, no, Norman, said James. You break it. Meanwhile, the inside of Bella's cafe was filling up with water like a great big bath. Trevor was soaking wet from trying to mend the pipe. It's flowing like the river tap, Bella. What can I do? I know. Where's the stop tap? It's under the end. Oh, I do remember. Try to think hard, my lovely. I'll dial 999. When Trevor lifted up the phone, the only sound he could get out of it was this. Back in the park, Norman was having a go with the remote control. The great Normando! she shouted. Master of the skies! The plane was zooming and diving all over the place. Suddenly, Norman made it fly straight to the children. The kids! yelled Penny. Don't worry! <laughs> laughed Norman. But when he pulled the control stick hard to make the plane swoop up again, the stick broke off in his hand. Look out! It's going to crash! shouted Sam. Norman threw the remote control on the ground and ran away. James picked it up. There was nothing he could do was broken, and they watched the plane as it flew out of the park and disappeared over the roof of Bella's cafe. Oh, we'll never see it again, said Sarah sadly. Yes, we will, said Penny. Come on. Off they ran, out of the park and across to Bella's cafe. The first thing they saw was water gushing out into the street from Bella's front door. Look at Bella's, said James. It sprung a leak. Penny went looking through the window. She could see cups and saucers and chairs and tables floating around the cafe. Trevor was up on the one end of the counter and Bella was sitting on the other end, leaning over the sink with her hand still stuck in the plug hole. Heavens, what a flood, said Penny. Now you two go to the call box and phone the fire brigade. I'll fetch the portable pump from the tender. While the children went off to dial 999, Penny took the pump over to the cafe and tried to open the door. She had to push very hard, and when it finally opened, water poured out onto the pavement like a waterfall. Don't let my cafe drown, shouted Bella. Where's the mains, Bella? asked Penny. Oh, 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 I forgot. It might be under the stairs. Ah, yes, I remember now. It's under the stairs. 
muttered Trevor. Brain of Britain. Fireman Evans, said Penny, giving the hose back to Trevor. I need your help with pumping out water. Oh, I don't Penny. I mean, uh, <laughs> firefighter Morris. Penny was just under the stairs, turning off the water, when Jupiter pulled up outside. Bella, said Sam, as he and Elvis came through the door. I usually behind the counter, not on top of it. I know, it's a terrible, my hand is stuck. Right then, Fireman Griddington, let's free Bella. As Sam and Elvis poured washing up liquid onto Bella's hand to make it nice and slippery, Penny and Trevor came back into the cafe and started the pump going to suck up the water through the hose pipe and out into the street. Hello, Sam, said Penny. Everything's under control. Lucky you happen to be passing, Penny, said Sam. Now, Bella, let's give you a hand a twist and see what happens. Bella's hand slipped out of the plug hole with no trouble at all. Oh, my hand is to come out. Grazie, Sam, my hero. As soon as the last drop of water had been mopped up, Bella made them all a cup of tea and a great big cake. I make the bellissimo gatto for say grazie for saving me from the drowning. Sarah and James had found their plane in Bella's back garden, and Sam promised to fix it for them. Hooray, said Sarah. Mega brill, said James. Lovely cup of tea, this, Bella, said Trevor. Pass the sugar, would you, James? Without looking, Trevor put a couple of spoonfuls of sugar into his tea and stirred it. Then he took a sip. <coughs> you all right, Trevor? Asked Sam. <coughs> Out of Trevor's mouth flew Bella's ring. It landed on his saucer. Trevor was amazed. Well, I never. Mamma mia, said Bella. Is the diamond ring. He go down the wrong pipe. Well, it must have been in the sugar, said Trevor. Anyway, it looks very sweet on your finger. And he took a hand and slipped the ring back where it belonged. There you are, my lovely. Oh, Trevor. When he 